conversation with Carol Rodland. Today uh, we are very fortunate and I am very honored to have Carol Rodland to be my guest. Um, while she's putting away her viola, I'm going to introduce to you in case um, you're not in the viola world. Uh, Carol um, is a multi-faced international uh, career violist soloist, uh, recording artist, and teacher. Um, she won first uh, prize of Washington International Competition, and she also was the winner of the University uh, Universal Editions Prize at the Lionel Turtis International Viola Competition, which is a very prestigious uh, viola competition. And she made her solo debut with the Philadelphia Orchestra as a teenager. Um, Carol Rutland often uh, performs with her sister, Catherine, as the Rutland duo, and with pianists uh, Baron and Macasta. She has premiered lots of uh, new works. So I have Carol Rutland's short biography in uh, the description of uh, YouTube, so you can check it out yourself. And she has a very handsome website, carolrotland.com. So let's see if she is ready. Hi, Carol. Hi. King. Hi. That was beautiful. Thank that was you. beautiful. I just um, realized that was actually a world premiere, what you guys <laughs> Awesome. My awesome. friend Gunter wrote this piece and sent it to me recently, and it's um, based on the last chorale from the St. John Passion. It's called Homage à Bach. Mm, wow. Yeah. It's very, um, very peaceful, and then it's um, very in kind of a sacred feeling, right? Mm -hmm. And yet it's, um, it's, it's hopeful. Yeah, I, I hear that kind of positive uh, message. Yeah. I feel like we could all use a little bit of that right now. I know. I know. Yeah. So Carol, um, I wanted, I read a part of your biography to our audience. And, uh, so you guys should check out her, her uh, lengthy ones on her website. Um, now tell us a little bit about your upbringing, your background. Yeah. My parents were both musicians. My, there were everybody in my family. You might be able to see behind me. There's an organ, and I'm right. I'm at my mother's house right now, and everybody in my family is an organist except for me. Both of my parents were, and my mother was also a choir, a children's choir specialist, and an orf specialist. So I grew up singing and dancing and running around and embodying rhythms. And many of my students, I don't know if they think of it this way, but I consider them the beneficiaries of that early orf training from my mother. <laughs> Yes. And then yes. I grew up, I had, um, because again, everyone in my family was an organist. I grew up as a pianist also and played the violin first. And then when I was about 13, I started switch hitting and playing viola because I really loved the middle register and the darker, deeper sounds. And so I, and then I started playing some viola and chamber music. And so I did both for a while. And then when I was about 16, I stopped with the E string. I always say <laughs> I blame it on my dog. She used to howl when I would play above the third position on the E string. Yeah. She would sing. So I said, finally, she's either telling me that she'll take over or I should stop. One of those two things. So <laughs> it's been all viola all the time since about then. Yeah, that's mm. funny. That's funny. So you have a, a very musical family, and I understand you play concert, dual concert with your sister. 
Yes, she's a wonderful organist and she teaches at St. Olaf College here in Northfield, Minnesota. And mm -hmm. that's where I've been here with my family since the middle of March, since the pandemic hit. I drove out here in the third week of March thinking I would be here for a little while. And now here we are at the end of July and I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> With my yeah, little Zoom thanks studio and the music. Thanks to Zoom. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thanks to Zoom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so tell us a little bit about um uh this this time. Uh people you're not seeing your students and you, you teach in Julia, you used to teach in Eastman, you used to teach in uh in NEC. Now uh now you're a Julia Viola professor. Um, so how do you deal with that? You don't get to see your student. And other than Zoom thingy, like, do, do you find it uh, very, uh, uh, very difficult to, to motivate some of the students? Well, in the summers, normally, the students have other festivals that they go to. And some of my students like your son sean is one of my wonderful students and he has had the the wonderful fortune to be able to participate somewhat i haven't talked to him much about how it's been with music academy of the west but many of my other students their festivals were canceled for the summer usually we go our separate ways then so actually to combat that my former teacher and dear friend and colleague kim kashkashian and i have been running these summer zoom studio classes every monday and wednesday morning for two hours we started on june 1st and then you were one of our first guests in the first week to help us get tech setups that we could use <laughs> we were so grateful for that and we had a wonderful just the, our friends have been so generous and we've had robert levin we've had garth knox we're having nobuko imai next week. Today we have Kyle Blaha, who's one of the ear training and theory teachers. He's a wonderful composer and he's one of my colleagues at Juilliard. And he, we had four of our students play this morning and we did two Hindemith sonatas and a Krennic sonata and some Schubert. And he helped the students to work through how to apply theory and ear training skills. So it's been wonderful to actually, I've seen my whole, most of my studio every week, two days a week, all summer, in spite of it all, which has been really great. Yeah, that's great. I hope it's been motivating them because I've certainly enjoyed these classes and all these wonderful guests we've had and giving us time to explore some aspects of, of our, our art and our life as musicians that maybe I, I consider it a silver lining that, first of all, that I've been able to collaborate with Kim in this way because we lived in the same city many years and we've been apart for a while. And it's just been wonderful to be doing that together and our studios getting to know each other mm -hmm. and talking about, we even had a former student of mine who's also a neuroscientist, Molly Gabrion did these wonderful presentations and um, question and answer with the students about ways to use brain science to help us practice better. So we're trying to find all sorts of ways to motivate ourselves. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of interesting. Um... Uh, you, according to you know Chinese uh, Chinese saying that uh, you you are my shi uh, mei shi mei uh, shi mei is um, we study with someone uh, we're studio we, siblings yeah. from a different yeah. time sibling right? yeah. <laughs> Yes. Sibling, we're a studio sibling, yeah. Because yes. I studied with Kim Kashkashan a long time ago, and then you studied with her also a little bit. But in Germany, also, I did my graduate work with yeah, you. In yeah, yeah, yeah. And you also Shimei because Shijie Shimei because you also study with Karen Tuttle. Yes, right? she, I always say Karen Tuttle kind of saved my life. I. Um, I was ready to quit because I was having a lot of pain. I, I actually had, um, I'd been in a car accident and was having neck problems and was getting so painful to play. And I was ready to go be a writer or do something else. And I met her and she said, well, if you do this, this, and this, you'll be all better and it'll be fine. And of course it took a long time, but I changed my technique. And yeah, I really felt that um, it helped my playing so much that that's one of the reasons I've always loved sharing and teaching. Um, and again, I think it must be in the genes because my parents were both wonderful teachers. Uh -huh. but I, I just felt like if I had to go through all of that, I wanted to help other people and share that that beautiful wisdom that that I have from my teachers. And I yeah. learned a lot from my students too, always. And, and 
do if someone is not in the viola world if they don't know who karen Toro was um do you if have you hold on one second i'm gonna hold up my book oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. so uh tell us uh one hey, you can see this we just published yeah, yeah, yeah. this book this year and it's from carl karen Fisher. Toro legacy yeah and there's yeah. A, i don't know if you can see it's carl fisher at the bottom yes carl the fisher. Uh -huh. awesome. yeah. so, so so do you have a a short version of who karen taro was and wh why they're like a she's basically a school right of 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 learning in viola the irony of all of this was she was the most free-spirited person i've ever met and she would hate to be called a method <laughs> oh. <laughs> she it, but she really um and if you if you have a chance to read our book i was so happy to collaborate with my colleagues on this project she would have been 100 years old on march 28th and so we wanted to publish this in her memory um, because she's touched so many lives. She really, again, she say, I consider her my viola playing savior. Mm -hmm. And then she was also Kim's teacher. And this book that I wrote is with Karen Richer and Jeffrey Irvine and Michelle, of course, and Lynn Ramsey, and again, Jeff Irvine and Kim Kashkashian. Mm -hmm. And th there are, of course, many other wonderful um, disciples of her who also feel she saved their lives in so many ways. And mm -hmm. so she, um, I think of it, it was very interesting the time that I studied with her, all of the things that we're fortunately a little bit more aware of, aware of in our profession of how to really take care of yourself because it's, you know, it's an athletic process playing an instrument. We're the athletes of the small muscles. And it used to be that dealing with injury and performance problems, physical problems related, that used to be something very hush-hush that you didn't talk about. And I, I think she was a real pioneer in helping people to find a way to play that in a way that was physically and comfortably comfortable and also emotionally communicative. And that she felt that how you worked and used your body as a whole was part of your technique. And so I have done a lot of Feldenkrais work and Alexander technique and couldn't live without my Pilates and that sort of thing. And, and she was very, what was amazing, she hadn't had any of that training and she was so intuitive. She just really knew how to, she could get right in there and see what was going on, how you were moving or what was blocking, whatever it was you were doing. And she just was brilliant at helping you to figure out how to do that better. And the beauty was you felt better and you sounded better. It was a double right. win. Right, right. That's wonderful. Yeah, I, I remember uh, those days, Kim often said, because she's about to leave after, you know, in in uh, in, in those those years, she was in Indiana, I think for a year or two, she, she decided to move to Germany. And she often said to me, actually, say, you should go study with uh, Karen. You should go study with Karen. But, but in those days, it did not register to me that you know, I wasn't brave enough to move to New York to to study with Karen. But uh, now, uh, tell us a little bit about. Um, uh, oh, congratulations! Your student, uh, my son, won last year's Julia competition. Yes. But tell us a little bit, like like how did you, how did you, how did you make him do it? <laughs> John, are you on this call? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe shows in his room. But well, I, the piece, the piece every year, um, and I don't know what's going to happen this year with coronavirus, but mm. um, Juilliard has a concerto competition for viola every year. They have it for every instrument, and on the alternate years, we have what one of the standards. Like last year, it was the Blochs. Uh, in sorry. 2018, it was the Bloch Suite 1919. This year, it was supposed to be the Walton Concerto. And on the alternate years, we have things not from what we would call the normal canon. And so the piece that was the competition piece for 2019 was the John Harbison Viola Concerto, which is a piece that I actually learned for the Juilliard competition many, many years ago. And <laughs> I had also then, and I loved it then, Oh. And I also played quite a bit of John's music when I lived in Boston, when I was teaching at NEC. I played in this wonderful group called Windsor Music with a fantastic oboist named Peggy Pearson. And she was very close, is still very close friends with John Harbison. And so he would write these wonderful, I played a lot of oboe quartets. So mm -hmm. trio and oboe of him. And I just, I really love his music. And um, I also feel, I love that at, at Juilliard that each year we can have a piece that maybe they wouldn't have another reason to learn. 
And so for, I never incur, I don't, I'm not a big fan of competitions unless it makes you work harder and play better, you mm. know, because <laughs> you can never, you never know what's going to happen with them. And if you set your sights only on winning, I think you missed the point, but the preparation was what I wanted for a number of my students. And I just, since you asked about Sean, I thought it would be really important for him at this stage in his development to learn how to learn that kind of a piece. Mm. And so, um, I just helped him learn how to learn this piece. And then somehow he got turned on and he really, really worked hard. So it achieved its purpose. It taught him how to think about music like this, that maybe was an unfamiliar language to him. Yeah. And also just having a goal can be a really motivating thing for people. Right. Right. It's, it's pretty hard. I mean, during the summer, he doesn't even know it. The competition is November. So, so I think only when school starts in September, he started work harder and harder. And then he said he uh, turned off all his uh, social media stuff. <laughs> so it was a great, it achieved its purpose, no matter what the outcome that it motivated. And yeah, yeah. I think that's what, that's what we want to do. So yeah. But thanks, thanks to you. Um, otherwise, um, he probably would skip, you know, he wouldn't want it to. I think early on, he wasn't so grateful to me for doing yeah. it. I think in the end, he was very glad that he did. <laughs> <laughs> so um, now, tell me a little bit about your um, project. It's called If Music Be the Food. Yes, If Music Be the Food of Love, Play On. This is a project that I started in 2009 in Rochester. I had just moved to Rochester the year before, and I've always been a supporter of food banks. We had a very dear family friend growing up who worked at, um, at the Lewisburg, Pennsylvania Food Bank, and when we'd visit her, she would show me how it all worked, and I, I just always felt like in a, in a country such as ours with so much that's, um, wealth that there were so many people struggling with food insecurity was something I've always just really you know, it just gets me right here. And so I wanted to, I just had a moment of inspiration when I was with Rochester in Rochester. I had a, a very dear friend who was a musician at one of the local churches. And I asked him, I just, I took him out to breakfast and I said, what would you think about having a concert series where, you know, we won't have a board, we won't raise money, we won't do any of those typical things that one does, but we will have people bring whatever they want to bring to give to the food bank as the price of admission. And that way we can share the music with the community and we can help our neighbors and nobody has to feel, the, the only rule about if music be the food is that people have to have joy in how they're sharing. And so I also wanted to teach our students about community service. And I wanted to provide an opportunity for students to learn how to run a concert series and also to have a chance to play with some of the local professionals and with their teachers. And so it, it's a, it just kind of brought together a number of my passions in life, feeding the hungry, feeding our souls with great music, teaching students of the importance of becoming active in the community. and. So we started it that fall, I guess, gosh, it'll be our 12th season um, in Rochester. And now there are projects that have been inspired by this all over the country. There are also, if you look at ifmusicbethefood.com, it's a very simple website because again, we're not a 501c3, it's just people wanted to start doing it too. So I send out, if anyone contacts me about it, I send out a document and say, these are the rules. Everything has to be donated. So that means the venue, any, anything that people want to give, the programs, all of the music. And if you don't have anything to give to the food bank, you are just as welcome and joyfully welcomed at the concerts. Um, but if you can give a donation of any amount, you know, sometimes somebody writes a thousand dollar check and sometimes someone can bring a box of pasta and it's all really important. So I guess that's a piece of it too, showing that every little bit counts and anything that we can do to make the world better for some for other people and for ourselves it's it's a worthy endeavor and i've just it's been such a joy to collaborate with people all over the country and we even have a series in canada now wow so it's That's just wonderful and people so, really want to help you know yeah so the now the pandemic is is in the middle how do you have your next concert 
That is such a great question and difficult answer because of course, live music and being in the same space to share that right now, we can't really do that. But some of the other series, um, a former student of mine who's in the Tucson Symphony in Arizona was the first one to do it. She was supposed to have a concert in May. So they did a virtual concert. And so they posted it on the Facebook page and did a, a Facebook live and you can still actually go and see that concert if you want. And then there's another series in, in Dickinson in North Dakota, and they are doing an outdoor socially distanced band shell concert in the middle of August. And then, as I mentioned, I'm here with my family and we are going to start a, a if music be the food Northfield for the community action center of Northfield, Minnesota. And so that's going to be a family concert and we're going to record portions of it and put it together. And um, a friend of ours, one of my sister's colleagues who also happened to live in Rochester when I did, will be playing harpsichord on this concert too. So we've got my sister and I will play some things, organ and viola, and then Jamie will play something on the harpsichord. And then my niece and nephew are now the, the Carson duo, their violin and piano duo. And so they will be performing a Brahms sonata on the concert. Wow, that's, that's wonderful. Fun. We'll be broadcasting that on August 9th. Wow. Awesome. If I can figure out how to do all the Facebook and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Facebook and live is, is easy. Yeah. You just yeah. need to make sure you have good connection, internet connection. Yeah. No, we were going to do it live, but since we can't all be in the same place at the same time, now we're putting oh. it together too. Oh, oh, oh okay. okay. I may be calling you about that. but. <laughs> 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 well, um, Okay, great. So let's uh, have a few announcements now. Uh, by the way, um, I am Ching Ju. I'm a filmmaker. I'm, I am also a violist, but I'm not practicing enough. So um, I, I don't perform uh, as much as I, I used to. And uh, um, I have been hosting this um, a conversation with someone special since uh, third week of March. So today, Carol, your episode is number 42. Wow. So I've been done 40. This is in, uh, including sometimes I chat with a group of people. Sometimes I chat with one person. Sometimes I chat with two or three. So depends on the situation. So now every Monday, Wednesday, consistently, I do a, a show at 4 p.m. Eastern time. So please, if you are not... Um, uh, a YouTuber uh, uh, subscriber, please considering subscribe my YouTube channel. Do you have a YouTube channel, Carol? Yes, I do. Okay. And I, I haven't um, posted much lately, but oh, okay. Will. But okay. you helped me. Ching helped me do some some teaching videos. <laughs> I, a, I did a, a residency online with the American Viola Society, and so we yeah. made teaching videos. Yeah, that's that was really great. You yeah. you you uh, we made us three segment, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we did. Uh, actually, we did four. We did four. a a setup and then left hand and right hand, and then we did a little thing with Claire Stefani to help people get good setups. Chin rest, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was yeah. Good. So check out. You just type in Carol Rotland, you will see those videos. Yeah, and uh, I wanted to thank you, uh, our audience. I want to read a couple of. We have a lot of people with us. Carol, you're so popular. <laughs> you know what? what? I have moved a lot, and I'm looking here and seeing such wonderful people who've been. Um, Part of different parts of my life it's amazing yeah <laughs> so thank you dion thank you nick is here nick is my young game friend thank you daniel spin uh and oh, gabrielle horse horse be yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> sorry <laughs> yeah he mentioned he gabrielle uh, said a beautiful i i assume said your playing is beautiful and then alexander nikova bravo absolutely fantastic and then we have uh, Madeline Levy. Oh, you know, I have to tell you, Madeline, hi. It's wonderful to see you there. Madeline, when I was in the pre-college at Juilliard, she was our studio pianist. So she oh. she played with me from when I was about 13 years old until through my school. Oh, my, so oh my God. It's great yeah. to be there. Yeah. She, <laughs> Madeline, thank you. She said, Carol, you are all grown up and uh, world-renowned but uh, now, but I had... A, 
I had the pleasure of meeting and collaborating with you when you were a teenager. At Julia pre-college. <laughs> oh, wow. There's nothing like going full circle, she said. And Dion said, Dion is a Sean's godmother. Dion said, if music be the food of love, play on love this. <laughs> <laughs> and then Gwen. Gwen, K R O S M I C. Okay. Wonderful, wonderful cellist. I've yeah. Pleasure she said, of you're amazing, Carol. Such an inspiration. And speaking of inspiration, um, it's, I, I was just, I'm very proud of myself finding you. Do you <laughs> <laughs> I'm very glad that you found me too. <laughs> do, you, do you remember how I found you? I told the story to other people. I don't remember how you found me, except I remember our first meeting when Sean played for me. He played the fifth box suite cello. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So let me let me tell how I found you. Okay, because um, when Sean was in Julia pre college at the at the at the, I think he only went for two years. So the in the middle of the first year, uh, Toby, Mr. Toby, Apple said um next year i only will be in julia 50 percent of time and you're free to go find somebody else if you want to you know i mean usually the teacher doesn't want students to leave right or, or maybe generous musician Toby's <laughs> amazing <laughs> yeah. so i was like okay well let me go look for so i looked through the the roster um and you uh, I had just were, come. I was yeah, just, you just, just come yeah there. come to to New York. You're new, and not that people on the list uh, like I don't like, but I don't know. I was kind of like a just very like okay. I'll check you out. So I I went to look your your uh, your YouTube channel actually. So it's very important to have YouTube channel. Uh, I saw some of your playing, not a lot, you know, and then and then uh, there was a Karen Tuttle workshop 2017 and uh, you're also part of the faculty yeah. so I actually registered that workshop oh, so I can check you out you came to spy <laughs> so I never knew that <laughs> <laughs> so I can know how you teach right because yeah. um because there's not enough teaching video on YouTube Anyway, that's what I went. I went, uh, I, I was there for a few days and then I talked to you. I said, could you listen to Sean playing, you know? And so so things going from from there. And uh, I am so happy I, I found you. It's not because me, it's because Sean really, 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 really loves you. Oh. <laughs> I love him too. <laughs> So anyway, you know, but actually, that's a, one of the things when I um, just I was very I thought I was going to stay at Eastman for the rest of my career. I was very happy up in Rochester. It's a wonderful place, wonderful school. But when your alma mater calls you, of course, you don't say no. And one of the things I thought, well, what would really be a wonderful way to give back is to be able to have a little bit of pre-college teaching as part of my load, because at Eastman and at NEC and at the Hansa Eisner, where I was before, it was all college teaching. And I've been teaching since 2012 with the Perlman Music Program, which is for ages 12 to 18. And I, I love doing that work. It's some of my my favorite work. I never have any more time off because when I'm not playing concerts somewhere or teaching at Juilliard, I'm with the Perlman Program, which mm -hmm. I love. So I thought, well, that's how I give back to the teenagers and help them to avoid some of the pitfalls that or some of the problems that I had being, you know, switching from violin to viola as a younger person where no one really told me they were any different, you know. And so I was so happy to be able to include a little bit of pre-college teaching in my load at Juilliard. And so Sean was part of that first pre-college class. I teach this year, it'll be four. I try to keep it between three and five. So four is kind of perfect for this coming school year. And then the rest of it's college viola. So. Yeah. I love so, that age too. Uh, did you feel kind of weird? Someone like me, you don't know, just come to say, can you listen to my son? Who's Was it a weird thing or not? No, I think it's wonderful. Oh. I love it. <laughs> I do. 
I'm actually <laughs> trying to figure out what the best way is to deal. Usually in the fall, this uh. is the time, sort of late summer, early fall, when people come and play for me and they come and visit the studio. I usually have them attend a studio class and I give them a consultation lesson just so we can get to know each other as they start to look at school for the following year. But yeah. now that we can't be together in person, I'm, I guess we'll have to do it virtually. So I'm making my peace with virtual teaching. Yeah. 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 So, so speaking of virtual teaching, uh, tell us a little bit about pros and cons of, of zooming teaching. Okay, the biggest con is that no matter what you do, and I'll show you some of the fancy equipment I have now, I am dying to have a real sound. I miss, I, I feel like there's a certain um, intimacy to working on Zoom. That I really feel like we've been able to accomplish a lot with my students. I'm amazed actually at, the, at how much we've been able to accomplish, but selfishly speaking, I my ESP still works on Zoom, I've discovered but I just really miss a beautiful sound. <laughs> and yeah. so I find usually in my normal life, I do my practicing in the morning. It's sort of like, you know, when you go um, on an airplane, they tell you to belt yourself in and then help the child next to you. So usually I do my own practicing in the morning and then I go to school and I can be there and generous and all of that. Here with the Zoom teaching, I find I actually need to practice after I've been Zoom teaching all day because I need to hear a real sound. I need to feel some vibration. Yeah. Um, so that's the biggest thing is the sound, just the sound, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The most. And, and also um, playing the uh, string instrument or any instrument is actually very physical, right? Because uh, it's, it's, uh, it, you, it's, it's, it's difficult not to touch or show someone how to do certain things, right? I mean, yeah. when you do it on the screen, it is all, it's different. It's a well, you know what gets funny, Ching is yeah. I'm just gonna show our listeners a few of the things in this room. Okay. Right so I've got I've yeah. got this. <laughs> I've, got, I've got this new That's thing one. <laughs> called the Focus Right Audio Interface. Ooh. And I'm, I'm not gonna mess up our whole setup, but yeah. I have a light so you can actually yeah. see me. And now I have this big monitor so yeah. that I can see everybody and I can actually see them quite close up. But what gets to be funny is when I'm sitting here and I'm looking at them, I'm trying to make sure the microphone's on and near me. I've got the headphones on yeah. and then I'm trying to demonstrate something with the viola without yeah. knocking the headphones off or the computer off the desk or getting too close to the microphone where I can knock <laughs> somebody out. Yeah. yeah, it gets to be yeah. a little tricky. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> wow multi multitasking multitasking yeah so let's see uh we have uh more people made a comment someone it, said in german what is that's my goddaughter and it was her father's piece that i played at the beginning oh my god what did she, she say Magdalena. she said uh, many greetings from berlin from your goddaughter so oh, that's so nice. and also another dear friend of mine who's a singer in the deutsche Oper in berlin and a very stella. dear friend also from berlin nancy grit hello stella Steliana, all these wonderful people. And oh, look at Gwen with the intimacy and excellent ability of the platform and the ears feeling clunky. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So we've actually, when, um, you know, when the pandemic hit and we, Juilliard decided to go online for the rest of the semester, you know, we went home after auditions and spring break and uh -huh. then we weren't allowed to go back. So I haven't been in school since I finished my last audition at Juilliard in March. Oh. Wow. And, but anyway, it's just been, we've done some switching with repertoire. So it's actually been very interesting. We've done a lot of work with solo Bach, with Rager suites, with Hindemith sonatas and all kinds of solo repertoire. And also helping people get back to what I call basics, which sometimes in the busyness of life, people forget to keep themselves in shape with the minutia. So mm -hmm. I think, I mean, I, we could have, I, I don't see any of my studio here, but I think that it's actually been in a, in a way beneficial to have, I mean, you always try to make the best of whatever situation that you're in. And I, yeah. I we've been able to, I'm hearing wonderful progress in spite of the difficulty of the time. Mm -hmm. These are all, you know, they're, the business of the world can't interfere because they can't go out. So they're really working hard on themselves and 
So again, yeah. we've switched some of the repertoire because we really miss, we have a wonderful studio pianist at Juilliard, Mickey Aoki. We started working with her regularly this year. We miss her terribly, but we can't, you know, we can't yeah. collaborate at this point. Right, right. So we've been doing other repertoire and working so, on basics and technique and lots of Bach. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. could could you give us some scoop of uh, semester, uh, fall semester, what's going on? I is think it going to be real, real school or virtual school? It's going to be a hybrid model, at least at Juilliard. They've come up with a wonderful plan where they're actually extending the first semester. Normally, it's 14 to 15 weeks. They're doing a three-block semester, one which ends up being 21 weeks. So for the students, in a way, they're going to get another extra half semester of lessons. And then actually, then the second semester will start in March and go until the middle of June, which causes a little bit of scheduling difficulty if the world gets back to normal. Some of us, present company included, have other engagements during that time. But we'll see how it all works. I mean, we just don't know what's happening. And just because of the pandemic and wanting to try to find ways to keep people safe, they've made block one so that all the academic classes are online. But we have the option to have about half of the lessons in person if we can find it, if we can find a way to make it safe for both student and teacher. So um, a couple of my international students will be staying home for visa issues and all of that. It gives us extra time to straighten out that paperwork. And then some of them, I'll be able to see some of my students, hopefully in a room with a real sound, maybe with a pianist. <laughs> I'm very excited for that. Yeah, yeah. We'll have to have our masks and our air purifiers and all of that. Yeah. Now let's talk about your your style of teaching a little bit. Um, I have gone through Chinese, Russian teachers, right? It's Chinese style, it's very strict. I've gone through American teachers, Hungarian teachers, George Janser. I studied with Kim, uh, studied with Mimi Tsvai, studied with Abraham Skernik, which uh, he uh, was the- Amazing. He was, yeah, he was the awesome. principal viola of the uh, Cleveland. Old school, Australia. awesome. Yeah, really and awesome. I also studied with um, uh, Cleveland principal, uh, Robert Vernon, mm -hmm. who, who is really, oh, really, 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 like when I go to lesson, like my feet are trembles, you know, it's like very strict. Well, he's but, amazing. Uh, but you, um, I did not study with you, but I observe your lesson with Sean and uh, I see you teach classes and <clears throat> you have this this really like um, you can make a criticism sound like you're singing. Sound like like what? Singing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you you can you can give a a device or construction to uh, criticize to your student, it sounds like so pleasing and so welcoming. So I just wanted to talk about like, like, um, are you always like that? Like, were you at certain point, like you're really strict to someone or, uh, you know, but is it because you're dealing with the college kids and they are, you know, how do you deal with a 12 year old who does not practice? Well, um, again, most of my teaching is already at a, I'm fortunate, it's at a level where people are already committed. Motivation is always something that we talk about. But in the end, yeah. I'm a big believer, sorry to be cheesy, but I believe in the power of love. <laughs> I do not believe in fear as a real lasting, joyful. I think music making needs to be joyful. It's about communicating and sharing with people. And if we're scared all the time, and if I think it's, I think it's not the way to go. I think it's not a good. It's not my favorite motivator. So I, I feel like, I think, <laughs> I've learned from some of my students. They say when I get quiet, that's when they know they're in trouble, because I really try not to say something I don't want to say. <laughs> <laughs> I had one student just really come up to me. She said, "You know, Miss Roblin, it's when you don't say something that I get scared." <laughs> That's very good. Yeah, I, I always feel like myself included, and this yeah. is the, the beauty of the work that we do, and the curses as a musician, as an artist. We there's always so much more to learn. We're never done. Our work is never done. Mm -hmm. We're never good enough, but 
you also have to, uh, and this was something that I've been just blessed with great teaching and starting with my parents, but mm. Karen Tuttle, you would walk into a room mm. and no matter what was going on in the world around you, what was going on in your life, she'd like, it was time to work, but you knew she loved you. She knew she'd meet you wherever you were. Mm. I, I, my life was rather tumultuous when I first started working with her. There was a lot going on. And those, the hour a week that I spent with her was like this island of inspiration and safety and calm. And she really taught me how to, or helped me even further to invest in my work as a safe space, to use that term. And mm -hmm. I like to try to bring that for my students as well, that they see and I think it served us all well during this time, this strange time that we're in. I'm so grateful for the work that we can do that and grow and change and explore, even in the midst of all of this. What a gift that is to have music. I mean, I, obviously, I think we all do. I, I'm looking at, at Gwen Krosnick, for instance, we were texting the other day. We're missing playing chamber music. I just really miss being in a room with my friends making music, sharing it with an audience. But at least we have we have this. We have time to do these things. You're doing these wonderful broadcasts that you started doing when the pandemic hit too, as a way to communicate, to reach out, because that's what we do as artists. And yeah. just to go back to your teaching question, I feel like I wouldn't say I'm not strict. <laughs> way where sometimes they don't realize that's what's happening. <laughs> I think that's clear. But I guess I always see it if someone's not practicing there's usually a reason for it. And I think it's, um, I think it's important to figure out what motivates us or not. Sometimes someone's not practicing because they are in a really intense program and that's not where they want to be. And I think there comes a point, I just have really, I'm very honest. That's like my, I'm honest to a fault, but I also feel like direct, there's no time in life to be dishonest and I don't believe in playing games. And I just say, look, are you not practicing because you're too tired? You have too much going on. Are you not practicing because you hate this piece? In which case we either need to switch repertoire or we need to make you learn what's good about this piece. And I will help you do that. Or are you not practicing because you don't like to do things that are hard? In which case that's something that's important to learn in life mm -hmm. to Sometimes you have to learn, you have to help a student to push through a wall. And sometimes you have to turn around away from that wall and go through another door. And that's one of the things I, I love about teaching is helping someone find their voice, find their own motivation, because in the end, that motivation has to come from within. Mm -hmm. We, right. And that doesn't mean, and I, <laughs> my niece and nephew don't like the lecturing that I give them sometimes, but it's like, you know, in the end, no one can make you practice past a certain point. You mm -hmm. have to want to. And the key to being successful is on the days and in the hours of that day that you really don't want to, if you can make yourself do it, that's the battle. That's mm -hmm. where you can. And so it's also the, the strength that can be derived from the discipline. I know that, I mean, I, I think of this, what we do. I mean, I happen to play the viola, but it's a life in music. It's a way of living your life. And I'm so, I love music and I'm so grateful to be able to live through this, but I think it's about expressing yourself. So you could right. just as easily be doing it as you are finding, you know, you, you are an artist, you are a wonderful violist. You've chosen to switch the balance of how you communicate with what you're doing. And I think also just because your son has your nice viola. So there's, <laughs> and, and, and there are many ways to express yourself. I mean, I, I I often thought there were many times when it was too painful physically to play and mm. that I was going to do something else. And I think I would have been so sad not to be making music because I love it. And yeah. so I'm very grateful that I've been able to go back to it, but I would have been a writer. I would have been a, a teacher. I would have been a singer, you know? Uh-huh. Right. And we can all find our ways to do that. Right. And I just feel like learning from a place of love, that's how we grow best. That's how the plant really grows for life. So I, I try to help my my students instead of yelling at them. If they, I mean, maybe I yell with some humor. So mm. that's maybe the manipulating mm. part, right? <laughs> I can make right. them laugh and then right. <laughs> you can find the way to solve the problem. It's about solving problems. But the, right. all my students are different. And that's why I love the work. I love helping people find the best way for them. Yeah. It's fun. So um, you would be a good lawyer if you're not. I actually thought about that. That was on the list, too. <laughs> 
Yeah. Yeah. I had a a very dear cousin who passed away way too soon. Yeah. As a child advocacy lawyer. Mm. And I thought if I'm going to be a lawyer, I want to be just like Erica. That's what, that's what I, (laughs) she, she, she was saving the world in the middle of the night, rescuing children from situations and things. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, by the way, you are you are the few uh, musician people who are very organized in terms of returning emails. That, Sometimes I don't practice that, enough, and I you, too many. Emails. Are you always like this? Like, are you always on top of your correspondent? Do you know? I have to say, I have this condition right now. I call it Corona brain. And- <laughs> Because I'm not in my normal routine, yeah. I'm, I've l- lost a few things now and again. But I try to be. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, right now, I've, I, I have forgotten some things, and I ask for oh, okay. for the people. Please, please yeah, email yeah. me again because yeah, I know yeah. it's not like me not to answer. But maybe I lost it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, yeah. Lately, you're not as good as before, but that's okay. Yeah. It's my Corona uh, brain. Corona. <laughs> but. Uh, in general, uh, you know, since I met you, uh, I'm very impressed by the way you, uh, you know, answer a correspondent on email. And I don't think it's, uh, I don't think everybody is like that. And I, because I spend a lot of time, you know, on, on computer. Um, and I really appreciate you uh, on top of you. the game. You know. Well, I, as I said, I've lost my yeah. game a little bit, That's but okay. I, yeah. I found that just to manage my career because I do I love to play the viola, so I I do have try to perform, and I you know I have my website and all of that, and then I also have a full time professorship because I love to teach, and then you know try to have a life part. So I I try to right. be organized, and I right. I have. Usually when life is in its routine, I do catch up a lot on the correspondence when I'm traveling. There's a mm. lot of work that you can do in an airport mm. <laughs> or a train station. Yeah. I also usually have, I have the emails in, you know, I have the emergency pile. Yeah. And then I have the, this can wait till my free day because it requires a longer answer. Yeah. So not that there's ever a free day, but, you know, you set aside time to do it. Yeah. yeah. Now, I'm sure um, lots of people... Um, Envy you, envy you being a professor at the Julia or professor at the Eastman before. Now, can you just give um, like a student or musicians a, a little bit uh, sort of a, because of course everybody's different, but I wanted to know a little bit about like, what is your key to success? Is it because you won competitions or is it because you had a great teachers or is it because you met someone special in the right place at right time or all of the above i think it's probably all of the above (laughs) and i i'm really i know i feel very fortunate that i've had i've been able to work in wonderful places i've had wonderful teaching again from the very beginning of my life i've had teachers who just supported me no matter what was going on and that that's a great gift in life and i also feel that if you stay as true as you can to who you are and what you believe in and look for the good, you can create good things in the world. That's just how I look at it. Again, that's a little cheesy, but (laughs) I'm I'm stubborn and naive and I have rose colored glasses and even through gritted teeth, teeth, I try to live by that. Yeah. And in the end we have to live with ourselves, right? Yeah. Also, (laughs) You came from uh, a family who are musicians. That also is a huge gift. Yes, and they also have always been involved. I mean, I, it was a family of church musicians, actually, and mm. social justice and uh, helping people, you know, at no matter what their level, to be the best that they could be yeah. in a volunteer situation. And the value of that, the value of teaching a child, no matter whether they're gifted or not, that what they have to contribute is important. I really believe that. Mm-hmm. Right. It's right. Really important. Yeah. So um, everybody has value. In yeah. Every yeah. 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 So uh, I have a, a question uh, for you is um, you have done lots of contemporary works, contemporary uh, modern pieces. Now, 
do you have a tip or tips for people to learn music language is not very familiar with? You know? <laughs> I love new music. And this class that we had this morning with Kyle Blaha, our, again, our repertoire was two hidden sonatas and some Kranich and really learning how to look at how a piece is put together, try to figure out the language of a composer. I love working with living, breathing composers because I can call them up and ask them a question. Yeah. And, um, and so I've actually, I had a wonderful period in my career where I was doing a lot of work with Augusta Reed Thomas, who's just, she's one of my heroes. And she has a way, she's a trumpet player actually. And she started taking violin pieces and arranging them for the viola and sending them to me. And then we would have these epic sessions on Skype at the time where she'd be like, does that work this way? What should we do? And it was just, it was so inspiring. And then there was, there was just this one day when she came, I, I ran for a brief period of time, a, a summer workshop at New England Conservatory for composers and performers, students and um, grownups and students together, composers and, and players to learn how to work with each other. And Gusty Thomas was our, our guest the very first year and she gave a lecture on opening night. She got up there and she just started scatting her pieces and this light bulb went off and it's like, oh, so that's how that works. <laughs> and then I had another experience. The first um, sort of commission that I did was for my New York debut. And I was living in Berlin at the time. And of course, that was before we had the way of sending things to each other really easily. And my friend, Christy Afanidis, mailed me a cassette of himself sitting at the piano singing some things, wanting to know what I thought of these ideas. And then he started faxing me pages in Berlin. <laughs> um, so I just love one of the adventures is when you work with living composers is everybody has a language and trying to learn what those things mean um, for different people, letting the music also see how it how it's put together, how it speaks for itself. I actually always encourage my students, and I did this for a number of them when they were learning the Harbison, for example, that you don't get the viola near you first. You really, you sit there with the score, you look at what is this music made out of? And then having grown up with um, solfege and ear training, the mm. next thing you do is you conduct it, you scat the rhythms, you, if they're unfamiliar intervallic patterns or non-tonal things that you figure out, well, what do these intervals mean? What is this harmonic language about? And mm. what's the rhythmic structure do? And really learning how to learn the music without feeling, because playing the viola is hard. <laughs> And so I always say, I'm not going to put the viola in my hands because I'll start feeling sorry for myself too soon. And I'll start for <laughs> the fast and easy way to do something. <laughs> so I don't let myself have any sympathy for myself. And then I'll get with the viola. I'll do the best that I can. And then if there's really something like if it's a new piece that someone's writing for me, if I've tried really hard, I like to try to find where's that wall between it's really hard. It's not something you normally do. And Honey, that's just not happening. Mm. <laughs> you know? and, there's like a, and again, that's one of the things I love about working with people on a new piece. It's one of my favorite things to do. Yeah, you can go back and forth, right? Also, yep. once you, uh, you you can ask questions or you can have them re reverse the, uh, you know. Right. Or I can have them beat me up and say, no, I mean <laughs> this and you better figure out a way to do it. That happens sometimes too. And then there's one more little aside. Um, since I do teach a lot, the, what we would call the standard viola repertoire is not mm -hmm. that big. Mm -hmm. And I actually, you know, I love my students, but sometimes their little habits and issues get into me. So if it's a, sometimes if it's a, if it's in my repertoire for a tour that I have to do or something, mm. I'll try not to have to teach some of those pieces right before I have to do something. <laughs> so it's, it's really mine. And, and I love playing new stuff because I don't, you know, it's all new. Nobody else has done it before. And yeah. it just helps me to feel more creative. Right. Right. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. So yeah. um, we're five minutes before five. Uh, um, I have, uh, do you have any question for me? Um, do you miss playing the viola more? <laughs> I've wondered that a lot because you're a terrific player. Uh, or is this this wonderful yeah. work that you do with your media yeah. company and your yeah. filmmaking, is that providing the creative outlet that you need? Um, yes or no. I, 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 yes or no. I, I do miss it when I see someone 
live performance, you know, when I hear you guys play, I do miss it. Um, no is because um, it, it's a different kind of work. It's so much more isolated, so much more disciplined work. Uh, I rather sit here editing a piece of film uh, all day, eight hours a day, but I don't have the discipline to practice three hours a day, you know? So that, that is my problem, yeah. So uh, editing film is, or working on video is like the post-production, it's, it's post. And then playing music is pre-performance. In other words, you practice and you practice, you practice, you prepare, then you boom, you perform. And you can still regret, says, oh, that yeah, You can't that take it fun. back, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So for filming uh, is, uh, is a different creation uh, process. It's a, uh, I have, I can manipulate my audience. It's like I'm, even when I go out to shoot a documentary, it is me telling the story. So there is a process of me uh, making the uh, create creativity there. You're composing, actually. Have yes. you, ever, are you, have you? Do you like to write music? Actually, have you ever No, I that? have not written music. No, but I think um, making video or uh, doing editing or making something from nothing, uh, it's a little bit like you know composing a little bit. Yeah. So so it's a, it's a different. So to answer your question, do I miss it? Yes or no? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I play, I play, but Sean's viola he's playing right now is a little too big for me, it's even big for him. So it's a 16, five, uh, five, uh, five, eight size. That's so way too I, big for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, so I play, what I play a little bit now, uh, even open the show sometimes on a five string violin, mm -hmm. five string violin. Yeah, it has a C string. So, but it's a violin size, it's a smaller. But so does it have an E-string? Yeah, it does. Oh, no. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm only kidding. That's five strings. So I can play high as high as whatever violinist play and then as low as viola. So mm -hmm. I just do that for fun, yeah. But definitely not very serious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So are you ready to do a, a rapid fire? Or do you, ha do you have any issues uh, we did not touch? Should we talk about? Um, oh, we talked. We covered quite a. I think we talked about a lot. There's I will, always so much more to talk yeah, about. Yeah. I love to hear you speak German. It's so, it's so exotic. Well, again, I studied with. I had a Fulbright grant, and I yeah. did my graduate work. I was. I studied for two years with Kim in Freiburg for my. Yeah. Can you, and can you I, say that in German? Ich habe hab in Freiburg studiert, ich habe meinen Abschluss von Freiburg und dann habe ich auch in, um, in Berlin, meine erste Professur war in Berlin an der hans eisner hochschule So that means my, my first job, was that my first full-time job was teaching in Berlin at the hans Eisner. Oh, yeah. so, so Gwen made a comment earlier, totally agree about teaching on Zoom. Yes. Can, you say, can you say the whole thing in German? Ja, ich stimme zu wegen Unterricht mit Zoom. Ähm, es ist intim, aber es ist auch, dass die Ohren, es tut den Ohren weh, würde ich sagen. That's just the gist of it. <lacht> awesome, awesome. So, yeah. Yeah, because I, where I lived, when my first job, again, this professorship was at the Hans Eisler in the mid-1990s, so it was shortly after the wall came down. Yeah. So I had to, you know, I was teaching in German. And when I went to study with Kim, obviously my teacher was American, but I also studied with some wonderful German teachers. I did chamber music with Reinhard Goebel and Rainer Kussmaul and some really wonderful German musicians. So I had I had my rehearsals and all of that in German. So I had to learn fast. But how did you, how, I mean, like, did you just learn German when you were there or you learned German before you well, went? Well, I had two years with Dr. Slamovitz at Juilliard when I knew that I was probably going to go and apply for this grant and study. And then I had also, um, I studied Latin for a long time in junior high and high school. And I think that forms a really good base. Yes. And I also had French. Um, oh my God. When you live, you know this, when you move to a country, you better learn the language. And I yeah. lived in Germany for seven years. So, you know. Wow. <laughs> That's just awesome. That's so yeah. awesome. Yeah. So, um, 
uh, before we move on to our last element, it's called rapid fire, which is a bunch <laughs> of a quick question. And I thank you, thank you, Carol, for talking with me and to uh, showcase your playing and also talk with our audience. And audience, if you have any questions, please write in the common area. Um, please um, check check uh, Carol's website, carolrotland.com. Very handsome. And she also has a um, YouTube channel. Um, so you just type her name in and you'll see her YouTube uh, clips. And please uh, subscribe this channel, Jewel Media. Just click on the red subscriber. And I just wanted to add, thank you so much, first of all, Chim Ching for having me. This has been really fun. Um, just talking about the pieces that I've commissioned, unfortunately, because of copyright issues, I'm not allowed to post my professional recordings that are, I have three albums on the Crystal Records label, and I'm not allowed to put them on my YouTube channel, but there are some really great commissioned pieces on these albums that I, if you feel like checking it out, it's Crystal Records is the label, and you can, there are three different albums. The first one is Viola Swirl, which sounds like ice cream, but it's not, and then there's, um, American Weavings, which is a duo album with my sister with organ. The first one was with Tatovik Mukatsi on, on the piano. And then the third album is with my dear friend, Scott Kluckstall, and it's with um, viola cello repertoire. Wow, that's wonderful, that's wonderful. Yeah, great. So let's see, um, I have some uh, <laughs> questions for, for you. Um, now, usually I do this rapid fire at the end, just kind of have some fun yeah all right so now i'm nervous <laughs> yeah, no 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 you're not you're not nervous. No, no this is all just this is so silly silly question favorite color blue look at us we're both wearing blue <laughs> <laughs> um favorite genre food oh that's a tough one all right i love food oh i really do i guess if i had to choose like a cuisine i really <laughs> love um i love great Italian cuisine. I love um, like Thai food. I really like Thai food. Yeah. I don't eat much meat, so I, I really. In fact, oh, I. Oh yeah, yeah. I love, I love vegetable based things. Yeah. Right. And I love right. summertime because we can get so many great fresh vegetables. We have a big yeah. garden out front, and we've grown some tomatoes that I'm pretty excited about. Oh, that's <laughs> <laughs> spicy or mild. Mild. Um. Now that I know, I was going to ask you a language you speak. So you speak English, German, French, uh, Latin. I don't, I don't remember any of the French or the Latin. <laughs> but if somebody's speaking it, I can pick it up. And actually, I can read that, read it. Oh, okay. Me. That's but awesome. Now, when I learned German, everything else went away. That's awesome. That's <laughs> awesome. So a uh, book you recently read that you really like? I am in the midst of Ibram Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist, and I'm just going to leave that right there. It's an amazing book. I'm in the middle of it right now. <laughs> Another book that I also just read recently um, is called Make It Stick. It's a wonderful book about uh, the science of learning. Oh, so that that's been a great book too. Awesome. But, are you are you do you love social media, and which one do you like the best? I'm not very good at it. So the only thing I love about it is since I've moved so many times. I mean, I've lived in Germany, I've lived in Arizona briefly, in Berlin, in Boston, in Rochester. I love that I can see what my friends are up to. But if I want to be in touch with someone, we pick up the phone or we text or we email. That works better for me. So you like Facebook? I don't love Facebook, but oh. <laughs> I I think it's useful as long as it use you. I mean, we, all, we all know what's going on. Well, they're not even on the hill today, but... <laughs> I love Facebook. I love Facebook. Cheese as long as you don't well, let it use you, you use it. <laughs> yeah. Facebook me, if, if some of you don't know me. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, you, are you a dog or a cat person? I love them both. I do. Yeah. I, I'm an animal person. I'm a, I, I love animals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this question, actually, I know, but I'm asking you anyway. Wine or beer? Wine. <laughs> dark and dry and red uh, you like red right okay i like yeah. really good dry red yeah me too me too me but too. if yeah. the weather's really hot i love a light sparkly white wine 
if it's oh. cold. Oh. <laughs> very nice, very nice. Um, ice cream flavor. Oh, tough call. <laughs> I've discovered a frozen yogurt here in Minnesota since I've been sheltering in place here from a local sort of uh, Minnesota uh, dairy called Kemp's and it's a frozen yogurt called Moose Tracks. And I like that because I think it's for the undecided. There's a little bit of everything in it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you say to a stranger? Like the first word you say to a stranger. Depends on the situation, right? <laughs> in a bar. In a bar. Hope, hello. <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember. I don't think we're going to get to go to any bars anytime soon. <laughs> I think that's the last place any of us should go right now. <laughs> I know. I know. Oh, okay. Well, all right. Good. Last one. Coffee or tea? Again, I like. it's kind of like the cat dog question. I love them both. <laughs> I do have to start the day with a nice strong cup of coffee, but then uh -huh. like I love to have a cup of tea in the afternoon. Uh, and yeah. I like herbal tea. I like green tea. I like black tea. I like all kinds of tea. Yeah. <laughs> I like iced tea in the summer. <laughs> um, iced tea, of course. Gabrielle said, thank you for bringing Carol to the show, inspiring in every way. <laughs> Starting from her smile and her laughs. Yes, yes. Oh, thank you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, speaking of uh, people we know, uh, 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 I met my neighbor. I live in the building, has 168 yes. people, family. I would run into someone and someone said, Shh, they know you and you were neighbors when you grow up. Isn't that amazing? Yes, they, they were members of the church I grew up in. Yeah. Their, their daughter was in my class, and we sang yeah. choir together. And, yeah. and actually, boy, their dad, I used to swim early in the morning. My last two years of high school, I'd swim laps, and he swam laps early in the morning, too. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Local Y. Yeah, small world. Small Very world. small world. It's a tangled web we weave, and it's a beautiful thing. I know. I know. Great. Well, um, we had fun and thank you so much carol thank you thank you for having me <laughs> yeah welcome and then uh yeah thank you and all the listeners our audience and people you know go back to practice now <laughs> we still have to play in tune <laughs> <laughs> with a beautiful yeah. sound and good yeah. yeah yeah so so uh one more time i uh i host um uh, uh, this talk uh monday wednesday now pretty steadily uh 4 p.m so next monday i will talk to john kearns who is an author uh, a writer uh, he wrote a couple of books and then on wednesday i'm gonna speak with a, a 20 year old Jessica Faith Marshall. She's a designer. She moved herself from Texas a few years ago to New York and to become a designer. And she's she's working and she's, you know, she's feeding herself. She has an apartment in Brooklyn. So pretty amazing. So I've talked to a lot of different people. So so yeah, uh check uh check this channel and check my uh Facebook and and uh, thank you for supporting the arts. Thank you for listening. And uh, until next time. Yeah, thank you, Ching. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right. So, bye bye, everybody. Bye. I'm going to click. Yeah, bye. I'm going to click the uh, end broadcast now. Okay. <laughs>